In this month's edition of Edutainment, we go behind the scenes at Hay Festival Segovia. Martha Thorne talks to innovative architect Shigeru Ban. We find an IE student working in the festival press office. And Rolf Strom Olsen in conversation with distinguished historian Jeffrey Parker. The Hay Festival of Literature and the Arts is one of Europe's most prestigious cultural events, once described by Bill Clinton as the Woodstock of the Mind. In recent years, the annual UK festival has gone global, organising sister festivals throughout the world, from Mexico to the Maldives. The Spanish sibling, Hay Festival Segovia, is now in its fifth year and has once again delivered a prolific programme of cultural curiosities, and IE University has been at the heart of the action. In its capacity as one of the festival's collaborators, the university has organised and run workshops, provided expert speakers to host public conversations with invited guests, and provided logistical support to many of the festival's 100 plus events. In front of a packed crowd, Associate Dean for External Relations at IE School of Architecture, Martha Thorne, spoke with internationally renowned architect Shigeru Ban. Before the event, in an edutainment exclusive, Martha and Shigeru had a quiet chat about teaching architecture, working in disaster areas, and the Pompidou Met Center in France. I know that you have taught a lot in the past and you continue to be a visiting professor at many universities. What do you try to instill or what do you try to share with your students? What's the most important thing for architectural education? Actually, I had a very good ex education. Uh, I was taught by many good professors, but I knew I cannot give them back anything. Mm. But something I can do is instead of giving back to the, the, my professor, but what the only I can do is uh, doing the same thing to my uh, the younger generation. Mm -hmm. That was my first motivation when I started teaching. But then the, the, the slight, the gradually I found the other uh, aspect for teaching. Normally architects is working for, even historically working for privileged people, mm -hmm. rich people, religious group, big corporations and so on. And also architect, uh, students also want to be star architects. It's also important that, that we are building not only for those privileged people, but also building for general public, but even somebody who lost their houses by big natural disasters, they need the houses. So we have uh, the opportunity not only work for privileged, but also work for the general public and also the, the people who lost their houses. You have often worked in areas that have suffered natural disasters, mm -hmm. so your example is probably a very powerful teaching tool. Um, and you said you take students to different areas? Yes. A few weeks ago I came back from Haiti. That, this is the second visit I made. I f first went to there in February, a few weeks after the, the, uh, the big earthquake. Right. Then I start preparing the shelter project with a student in Santo Domingo, uh, Dominican Republic, it's next door country. Mm -hmm. And this time I brought 25 students, uh, including Haiti foreign student, uh, to, to Haiti to build uh, temporary shelters. But also we uh, taught, uh, trained the local people to build them by themselves. Oh, wow. What exactly did the students do? How were they involved in the project? Well, Actually, the, 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 when I went to there first time in February, I went to there with a student to look for the site, right. the, to look for the people, the group of the people who need the shelter. Right. And also then I did a workshop in their campus to mm -hmm. teach them how to build a temporary shelter. Mm -hmm. So mean, after I went back to home, I, 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 they started build, making the, the materials, preparing the material for shelters. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what we have done in, in the first time. Then second time I went back to there uh, second time, I went there with student to build the shelter that was prepared by student. That's great. Uh, Shigeru, I just wanted to congratulate you uh, not only for your work in disaster areas, but I know that the METS uh, in Pompidou recently opened and um, it seems to have opened to great acclaim on the part of uh, the people there. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the city and the people mm -hmm. who visit it. Mm -hmm. um, does that give you a lot of satisfaction? Well, as I said that originally, I, I'm not, uh, ob have, I don't have any objection to work for privilege. Making the big monument for the city is also an important uh, job for architects. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was so happy to see the general public. They are really happy to see my building, visiting my building. Mm -hmm. And they said that they are very proud of this building for our city. 
that time I, I knew it, even working for a big institution, yeah. also that it's also the same time I'm working for general public, although I'm making the big uh, monument. Shigaroban, thank you again for your visit to Segovia. I certainly hope that um, we get to see a building of yours soon in Spain. And again, thank you for coming to Segovia. Yes, thank you very much for this opportunity. Roxandra is a second year bachelor in communication student. She spent four invaluable days on work experience at the festival's press office. The press office of Hay Festival basically helps all the journalists that want to write about the various events that we are organizing to just have a place where they can write and find out all the information that they need. Um, that's, this is one thing. And the second thing is uh, we, are, uh, we attempt to preserve the high cultural character of the festival. At the end of April, our class, communication class, was visited uh, by Carlos, who runs the press office. Buenos dias. And uh, Geoffrey, the director of communication of IE University. And they told us that they were willing to co-opt various students of communication to work for the, the press office of the festival. And uh, we were asked to send uh, our letters of motivation by the 1st of May, which we did. And uh, then we just, we were uh, recruited Working in the Hay Festival press office um, is as challenging as working in any, any real world um, setting basically. It's the fact that very many things happen all at once and uh, you have to attend to maybe two or three things at the same time. So it's um, a big feat of multitasking and also in class you do learn practical things but you don't really get the opportunity to go out there and to meet um, all these people. So uh, I get the practical experience and and I also have uh, the possibility to get in contact with people I probably would never meet otherwise. It has been a very positive experience and I'm looking forward to seeing um, what's, what's coming up. In a fascinating discussion of leadership challenges in historical perspective, IE School of Arts and Humanities professor Rolf Strom Olsen shared the stage with august military historian Jeffrey Parker. Before the public conversation, Rolf and Jeffrey had a private chat about warfare, democracy, and the West. Jeffrey, let me start with, uh, with I think, an obvious question. You finished your um, graduate studies at the time that the British Empire was sort of uh, in eclipse, uh, at the time that the American uh, Empire, as we would call it, uh, was sort of in full throat, and you chose to study the Spanish Empire in the 16th century. In retrospect, clearly there was a connection, but I was not aware of it at the time. What I was conscious of was writing a book about why Spain failed to put down the Dutch Revolt, a revolt a thousand miles away, uh, involving the deployment of enormous resources of men and munitions and money, and it was losing. And at the same time, I saw every day on the television screen uh, films of American soldiers fighting as best they could in Vietnam and losing. And I think that was probably the most important influence that I saw the Spanish road, which was the subject of my thesis, uh, how Philip II, Philip III, Philip IV managed to get those resources to the Netherlands 1,500 kilometers away. I saw the Spanish road as a sort of Ho Chi Minh trail. So I was conscious of a, a, a reflection uh, from the past into the present. Uh, I think probably I was conscious of an empire in decline and an empire in decline in which I was living. But not at the time, that wasn't as clear. But the, the Vietnam War, you couldn't get away from it. You know, you've written uh, extensively on, on various aspects of the history of warfare. You're the author of The, the Military Revolution, uh, his, the Cambridge uh, History of Warfare, uh, available in Spanish also, right? Historia de la Guerra. Um, this question of warfare, right, as it exists, I think, through human history as a sort of endemic uh, characteristic of human society, do you think there's a, a particularly Western way of pursuing war? And I think we could even complicate the question further by, is there a democratic way of pursuing war? You have two questions there. One is the Western way of war, uh, which I think does exist. The other is a theory which was put forward by political scientists uh, in the 90s that on the, on the whole, democracies don't make war on each other. And I think in, in Latin America that has been demonstrated, unfortunately, not to be true. Why are they the democracies, yeah. though? <laughs> um, okay, well, I'll leave that to you, Rolf. You're, you're the guy who knows 21st century history. But I do think uh, there is a Western way of war. It has certain characteristics. Uh, Non-Western societies tend to go for numbers. Uh, they are, if you like, uh, uh, labor-intensive warriors. We are capital-intensive warriors in the West. We try and make a lot of a little. We go with the toys, not with the boys. 
I think that's very important, and I think there's one other characteristic of Western warfare I'd like to underline, and that is the ability of the West, simply because there's been so many wars within the West, of developing what one might call a challenge and response dynamic. That's to say, when you have a war going on, the penalty of not imitating the other guy is extermination. So when you have a challenge, you have to respond to it, and you have to respond quick, and then you have to develop something better than he's got. And you see this a great deal in World War II with the search for the miracle weapon. And uh, the Germans have it. They have it with the V2. There was no way it could be stopped. They just developed it too late. We developed the atom bomb. <laughs> Again, you couldn't stop it. And in fact, we've almost taken the soldier out of war uh, today, in a way, Well, right? that's an interesting question, isn't it? I mean, Rumsfeld's doctrine, Rumsfeld uh, uh, had never seen active service. He was, he was a, a naval officer, but he had n never seen active service, just like Bush. Uh, uh, and uh, Rumsfeld believed that if you brought in just-in-time logistics, uh, you could, in fact, eliminate a large number of soldiers. He really believed Works to build that, a car. Right. He really believed that 130,000 Americans could take over a nation of 25 million people and a country the size of California. And he was right. He made his big mistake in thinking he could hold a country the size of California with 25 million people with 130,000 Americans. And he was told beforehand that wasn't going to work. He didn't want to know. Yeah goes against the narrative. Goes against the narrative. Small numbers of people can do great things. Yeah. Jeffrey, thank you so much for coming by. I've really appreciated our chat today. We'll see you again next time for another edition of Edutainment.